So, Flannery, thank you for joining us today. <laughs> so excited to talk to you about the Women of the Lost Territory. What is the Lost Territory? <laughs> so the Lost Territory is a phrase from the novelist and short story writer Kali Fajardo Einstein. The characters in her books talk about the place that they come from, whether that is the San Luis Valley or northern New Mexico, as the Lost Territory. And they mean that it is lost because it was lost in the U.S.-Mexico War. Um, when uh, the United States seized the territory that is now the Southwest, and so that was their homeland. Um, and it is lost in that they have left it. Uh, but it is also lost in that that history is not always told, and the women's history of that landscape is especially not always told. And so it's also been lost to history in some regards. So it's it's lost territory in that it is territory that was taken by a foreign power. It's lost territory in that it's territory that they no longer live in. And it's lost territory in that it's territory that is not always remembered um, by historians or in popular historical memory. Well, then who are some of the women of the lost territory? I think that depends on how you, where you begin. <laughs> uh, some people might consider any, you know, woman in Southwestern history part of the lost territory because women's history is not as frequently told as men's history is. And for decades was not even taught um, in universities or in high schools. So that's, you know, we could say any woman, our mothers, our sisters, our grandmothers, our great grandmothers. Um, I think of some of my ancestors um, as women of the lost territory. But I think it's also true that we might consider women of the lost territory to be um, Anglo women who moved to New Mexico and uh, participated in major events in New Mexico history, uh, the creation of the nuclear bomb, uh, the making of an arts community. We might also consider women of the lost territory to be indigenous and Nuevo Mexicanas whose stories also are not always told. Uh, women like Nino Terra Warren, uh, the first woman to run uh, for Congress um, in New Mexico. Uh, people like um, Edith Warner, um, who I think we're gonna talk about some more, a really private woman who came to New Mexico because she found the landscape healing. So tell me about more about Edith Warner's. So Edith Warner uh, was originally from back east and she suffered a nervous breakdown actually and came to New Mexico and really found especially the landscape around the Pajarito Plateau uh, to be inspiring and she wound up settling there and she was kind of a security guard. Um, so the Los Alamos Ranch School which was at the top of the Pajarito Plateau had supplies delivered um, via train. And they often had to wait overnight before they went up the hill. And so Edith Warner had a little house at the bottom of the plateau where she would meet the train, un watch the supplies, and then they would be shipped up to the ranch school, the boys' school, uh, the next day. So that, that was her job, um, and she ran a little tea room there uh, so that people who stopped on the train um, could have refreshments. What, what, what is important about her story to New Mexico, especially I know she was hosting a lot of scientists who were a part of the Manhattan Project at the tea house. Um, could you tell me a little bit about that? Robert Oppenheimer had visited the tea room and had visited that part of New Mexico. Oppenheimer loved riding horses, loved the outdoors, had already been to this part of the country, had already been to Edith Warner's tea room. And when he was consulted by the federal government for a remote location for the creation of the atomic bomb, he said, how about there? Um, so he once said, you know, my two great loves are physics in New Mexico if only there were some way to combine them. Um, and suddenly there was a way to combine them. So the, the lab site was chosen for that reason. The federal government um, seized land from San Ildefonso Pueblo, Santa Clara Pueblo, and um, neighboring um, Nuevo Mexicana populations, as well as the property of the Los Alamos Ranch School. And that meant that the tea room was nearby, but Edith Warner no longer had 
the business. You know, people weren't stopping on the train because they weren't running those routes to protect the secrecy of uh, the bomb's creation and she was no longer watching the supplies. But Oppenheimer managed to convince military security that they should keep the tea room open and scientists would go there to relax from the extraordinary stress um, of making the first atomic weapon ever. And Edith Warner became good friends, um, especially with many of the women um, who were in Los Alamos. So unlike a lot of other military operations, civilian scientists who were involved in the creation of the nuclear bomb were allowed to have their families with them. So Edith Warner was witness to a baby boom at Los Alamos, which kind of presaged the, the baby boom of the post-war period and got to be very close um, with the Fermis, uh, with the Oppenheimers, and with the Wilsons, I think. Tell me a little bit about uh, Maria Villapondo's story. So in 1760, uh, Maria Villapondo, who lived in Ranchos uh, de Taos, was captured by Comanche raiders. And there was a great deal of raiding um, back and forth uh, between Nuevo Mexicana and um, indigenous populations in the 18th century. She was separated from her infant son, Jose, and traded to the Pawnee, um, who lived on the plains at that time. She lived with the Pawnee for 10 years and had a child while she was among the Pawnee. And ultimately, was ransomed or perhaps purchased. So some people see this captive um, trading as a slave trade. Uh, so she was either ransomed or purchased, depending on what word you want to use, by a Frenchman who brought her to St. Louis. And the Frenchman actually had quite an extensive and profitable fur trading enterprise. They were married um, in St. Louis in 1770. He returned to France and never came back. And we don't know quite what happened to him and if he died on the journey, if he died there, for whatever reason, he didn't come back. Maria Rosa Villapando inherited this vast fur trading empire. 1802 rolls around. This is when Lewis and Clark were preparing to leave St. Louis uh, for the famous Lewis and Clark journey. So before Lewis and Clark, before the Santa Fe Trail, before the railroad, certainly before automobiles and the internet. 1802, who shows up in St. Louis? Jose. And he had heard, you know, kind of through the network, the really dense network of indigenous people and Spanish and French traders um, that stretched between St. Louis and Northern New Mexico, he had heard that his mother was a very wealthy woman. And he wanted to know if he could get a piece of that wealth. If I am remembering correctly, he did not get very much. Um, almost all of her wealth went to her French children. And although she herself was a victim of this vast trading network, um, this vast slave trade network, she enslaved women of African descent in St. Louis, uh, which was slave territory um, when it became part of the United States. So there are contradictions in her story. And what about um, Genoveva Chavez? I love Genoveva Chavez's story quite a bit. So I'm originally from Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Genoveva Chavez was from uh, Santa Fe. She was born in 1942, graduated from Santa Fe High in 1960. She was by that time already a mariachi musician. Uh, her mother sang and her father played in a mariachi band growing up. And she performed for Santa Fe Fiestas, which a lot of your viewers probably know that is still ongoing. She had already begun performing for Fiestas. She graduated from high school, decided to go to Los Angeles uh, to explore ranchera music and um, continued mariachi performance. While she was in LA, uh, she came out as a lesbian and it's likely that Los Angeles, which had a much wider network uh, of queer people in the 1960s and 1970s, was more uh, comforting and supportive of her lesbian identity. 
while she lived in LA, she performed on The Love Boat, uh, which served as the inspiration for the 1970s television show, The Love Boat. And I love that she was exploring her love life while she was doing that work. But ultimately, she returned uh, to Santa Fe. And um, although you know, the whole time she was in LA, she would come back for fiestas every year which was very common for Santa Feans who moved to Los Angeles after World War II. Um, and a lot of Santa Feans moved to Los Angeles after World War II. A lot of them came back for fiestas. So um, she came back every year, but ultimately uh, she returned and lived with her long-term partner, uh, Dorothy Rivera. And uh, she returned probably because she suffered from lupus and it was just hard to have that kind of demanding entertainment career alongside um, a chronic illness. So that's how she came back uh, to Santa Fe. And by that point, there was a larger, less of an open secret um, a queer community in Santa Fe. And so she, she had a, a wider source of support then. I think I remember reading a quote where she said she was just happy that she could make others happy with music. I yes. thought that was great. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and she uh, she really broke a lot of ground. And mariachi musicians generally were not women um, in the 1940s and 1950s. And so she was one of the women who helped change that in the 1960s and 1970s. And Matilda Cox Stevenson, who is she? Yeah, so Matilda Cox Stevenson was born in Texas, uh, but grew up between Texas and Philadelphia. She came from a, a pretty wealthy family. She married a guy named James Stevenson who worked for the U.S. Geological Survey. The U.S. Geological Survey was run by um, a guy named John Wesley Powell. Powell um, was a Civil War veteran. He had run the Colorado River with only one arm. He had lost the, the arm during the war. So Powell was a really colorful figure. He attracted these colorful figures to the geological survey. And he had within the geological survey um, this uh, federal government organization called the Bureau of Ethnology. And Matilda Cox Stevenson went to work for the Bureau of Ethnology. Powell and the people who worked for him had a really Victorian mindset which largely believed that Native American people were dying out, um, that indigenous people were not gonna live much longer. So she did her ethnographic work believing that it would be necessary for the future so that future people would know about indigenous lives. Now, of course, that wasn't true at all, right? Like, like, that, that mindset was wrong, Powell was wrong, <laughs> Matilda Cox Stevenson was wrong. <laughs> None of that was true. Um, but because she was really devoted to this. And white ethnographers, white anthropologists, um, uh, uh, white male anthropologists were just the same um, as Matilda Cox Stevenson. But she got a reputation, because she was a woman, of being pushy. And um, white male anthropologists were, you know, stealing sacred information. They were um, taking artifacts that they should not have taken from Native people. Matilda Cox Stevenson did that also. Um, but she thought she had to do that because she thought that's what it meant, you know, to make it as an anthropologist. I actually, she was the first anthropo, like one of the first women anthropologists. She was, was she was the first woman to work for the Bureau of Ethnology. So yeah, in, in that respect, she was one of the first women anthropologists in the United sure. States. And she did most of her research at ZUNI and became a good friends um, with a um, non-binary figure named Wiwa. And uh, Wiwa um, befriended uh, Matilda Cox Stevenson in 1879. Um, Matilda Cox Stevenson helped facilitate employment for Wewa. Wewa journeyed to Washington, D.C. in 1886, uh, so a pretty important Zuni figure, and is a great example of how even in this really unequal situation, you know, Matilda Cox Stevenson is stealing stuff right and left, sharing things right and left that she should not share and yet still learns from Wiwa that indigenous culture is different 
and is not necessarily um, on a lower level than white culture. So for the 1880s, that was revelatory. And their friendship kind of shows, it, it kind of paved the way for a later generation of anthropology that said, wait a minute, you know, like some cultures are not better than others. That's not the way it works. Um, and so that in, although, you know, Matilda Cox Stevenson herself never fully emerged from that uh, mindset, she, she helped kind of prepare the ground for that. Well, what, what about each of their stories really speaks to you? I think something in all of their stories that speaks to me is the way in which travel can educate. So Matilda Cox Stevenson, you know, went from a really different world, you know, Washington DC um, to New Mexico. Genoveva Chavez went from Santa Fe to Los Angeles. Uh, Weewa went from New Mexico to Washington, D.C. <laughs> um, Edith Warner went from back east uh, to New Mexico. So the, all of them were, were seekers in one way or another. And all of them found a way of making a home and celebrating what they most appreciated about their home and advocating for what they most appreciated about their home wherever they landed. So one scientist uh, regarding Edith Warner said, she proved that men can create more than wars and bombs. So to, even though she was, you know, in a way, an assistant to the creation of the bomb, she wasn't remembered that way by the scientists who participated in the creation of that, you know, really horrific invention. And they knew it was a really horrific invention, and yet she allowed them to retain their humanity in, in the course of that process. So, and I, and I think that's what the travel was about for all of those women. How do we retain our humanity? How do we um, share what is best about our culture without risking um, what is best about our culture? And all of them took risks and, and there were some losses, but at, at the end of the day, I think that's what I find most inspirational about them. And how is each of their stories relevant to us? Right, well, I think that's where the mistakes come in handy. Genoveva <laughs> uh, Chavez was willing to have her sexuality be an open secret, but there's a cost. Um, there's a cost in a connection to community. There's a legal cost um, when sexuality is an open secret. And so, you know, I, I don't know, she had, she had limited choices, um, so I don't want to call it a mistake, but I think we can learn from our collective mistake, uh, you know, of insisting that um, it be an open secret, uh, that her sexuality be an open secret. Edith Warner, I think, you know, was really troubled by the bomb's creation. There were opportunities all along the way for those scientists to say, we're not gonna do this after all. Uh, so, you know, that's a, a huge mistake. Matilda Cox Stevenson, I think, was so ambitious as an anthropologist that that uh, outweighed her friendship with Weewa, her, um, her, her sharing of information. Uh, she could have been a lot more respectful um, had she you know, troubled to think about what is most lasting in our lives. Is it our friendships um, or is it our professional success? And um, I, I know that some figures in, in Zuni and Weewa may have been one of them, have received a program you know, from the rest of, of Zuni Pueblo about sharing information that shouldn't have been shared. So, and that's, that was a quandary, I think, for all indigenous people of the late 19th century, how to protect homelands, how to protect sovereignty in the midst of this onslaught of US federal and Anglo interest and attention and desire uh, for Pueblo knowledge, um, Pueblo land, Pueblo information. How do you think Maria Villapondo's uh, story is relevant to us? Uh, yes, uh, so I tell the story of Maria Villapondo because she provides a name and a memorable story for the thousands of women and children who were a part of this slave trade in the 18th century. 
The historian Esteban Rael Galvez is engaged on, in, on a super ambitious, exciting project to name all of those people, all of those people who were enslaved in the New World as a part of this um, other slave trade. Um, aside from it is other in that it is different from um, the African and African American uh, slave trade that existed in the US. So he is giving a name to everyone. In the meantime, we have Maria Rosa Villalpando's story to stand for all of these nameless women and children who traded hands um, in the 18th century as a part of that slave network. And why don't we know more about these women? I think that's a product of a few, a, a, a few issues. One is that women's history was not widely taught in universities um, or in high schools uh, until the 1970s. A second reason is that those stories have been taught unevenly. Um, so there's a kind of waxing and waning in interest and enthusiasm and support for women's history and for history of sexuality. And when that um, declines, then those stories don't get told anymore. A third reason is that, and I call myself to task for this, um, historians like me have not always done a great job of proving how women's stories are critical how they change the story, that when you include women, that actually changes the story. So instead of you know putting Edith Warner or putting Maria Villalpando in a little box on the side of our text in the textbook, they should be the main part of the text, right? They they changed the story, and so that's that's why I think we don't always hear them. Is that when they do get included, they often get included in this ancillary, off to the side way. And. Why is it important for you to share their stories with us? Well, number one, it's my job. Right? <laughs> I'm a professor of American studies. It's my job to um, teach the, the history and literature and culture of the United States and of North America. So um, that's one reason I think it's important. It's my job because a lot of other people think it's important. Uh, for um, girls especially, it's important to hear their stories told um, as vital to the historical record because then they realize that what they do matters. Um, so it matters in that regard. But it also matters in that if women change the story, you know, if we, if we understand the slave network that Maria Rosa Villalpando was a part of, if we understand that, then all of us can make better decisions in the future by virtue of our historical understanding. But if you don't include the women and children who dominated um, you know, the trade products of that trade, if you don't include them, then you don't know that story. And then you can't learn from that story in the future. So is there anything else that you would like to t like discuss about the women? I'd say only that all of these women are just a little first taste, you know, an, an appetizer in the banquet <laughs> that is women's history of New Mexico and of the Southwest. And so if anyone is interested in any of these women's stories, there, are, there is so much to learn um, and so many great books um, that can carry people further. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Flannery. That was awesome. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. <laughs>